So each night we've been taking up uh, pairs of words, words that are found throughout the gospel message and found in your New Testament. And they're words that seem to be on the opposite end of a spectrum. And yet we see that in the gospel message, and especially in the cross of Jesus Christ, these words are brought together. And tonight our two words are the words lost and found. Lost and found. And so it's my uh, job tonight to speak on the word lost for the first uh, 15 or so minutes here. And then Matt's going to finish with a message on the word Found. So, very famous verse we're going to read in the Gospel of Luke tonight, and it's a, wor- a verse that has that word lost in it, and it's found in Luke 19 and verse 10. Luke 19 and verse 10. Luke 19 and verse 10, you can go through your New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Uh, Luke's one of these great Gospel writers. He was a doctor, um, and yet he uh, he keeps it simple here. If you've ever um, thought that maybe what doctors say is complicated, here's a very simple statement coming from the lips of the Lord Jesus, recorded by this man, Luke, here in the gospel. Luke 19 and verse 10. This is what the verse says here as we read it. Luke 19 and verse 10 says this, For the Son of Man, that's the Lord Jesus, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Those words are the heart of the gospel. If if you were to say, sum up Christianity in just one saying, it's, it's these words of Jesus Christ to sum up Christianity, to say, give me the gospel in a nutshell. We often use John 3 and 16, but Give me the gospel in even a smaller nutshell. We'd say Luke 19 and 10, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. It's an amazing verse because it it flies in the face of what every other religion seems to tell us. You go the world round and you stop in at any other place that attests to the fact that they can tell you something about God and they're, they're telling you, you seek him. We have people who make pilgrimages, people who have donated funds, people who have done things, you name it. They've they've changed their dietary restrictions. They've they've given more of their income. They've they've got on their knees for a longer period of time in prayer. They've, They've read more. They've gone more. They've done more. And all this doing, why? Because they're seeking God. They're seeking to find him. In fact, it's a we live on a globe of God seekers just looking for him. And here, you read the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and you realize we had it all backwards. Men are trying to do their best to get closer to him, to seek him. And all the while, the verse and the words of Jesus Christ says this, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's seeking us. He's coming after us. If if you've searched your whole life for God and wondered if you'll ever get to the point where you'll say, got him. Maybe tonight you rest from your search and realize that Christ is looking for you. It's not a matter of me getting him. It's him getting me. And this verse tells me. It tells me the man who's seeking tells me how he's doing it. And it tells me who he's looking for. We're going to look at that tonight in here. And this very short but very powerful verse in Luke 19 and 10. The son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, I just want to speak upon tonight who was looking and how he looked, but uh, I, I can't think of this verse and not think of the lost and found box that I don't know if they still have them. It seemed to be every, I, I must have had to have looked in at least a good dozen lost and found boxes in my life from my high school in Midland Park to uh, I think at Six Flags, I had to look in a lost and found box twice um, at, at, at arcades and everywhere. At, I was always losing, it seemed, a wallet or something special. And To have to look in a lost and found box is one of the saddest moments of any seeker's life because you look into that box and you realize right away, it's not a lost and found box. It's a box of things no one is looking for. You you see scrunchies, half-used pencils, uh, but never a wallet, never never a single piece of currency. It's all stuff that people have forgotten about. They're not looking for anymore. Let me assure you tonight, 
let me assure you from the word of God that if you are listening here tonight, I could say even people who aren't listening, that souls are of the utmost value to this man, Jesus Christ. You say, how can I be sure? I, I, I've often wondered my value to society. I valued, I wondered my value to my employer. I've wondered my value in my family. We wonder about these things. Where is it in the level of, of, of that? And you say, this, this verse right here tells me my value to this man is of the highest form. Because we'll realize tonight how far this search and rescue mission led him when the Son of Man came to seek and to save those that were lost. So it has nothing tonight that's akin to anything that you'd find in a lost and found box because Christ is searching for souls and he makes no, he makes no uh, as it were, standard of the type of people he's looking for. It's just that they're lost. He's looking for lost people. That's significant in our Bible. The Lord Jesus said, I didn't come for righteous people. I came for ungodly. I came for sinners. He says, he goes, the physician, he called himself. He said, I didn't come for people who were healthy. I came for those who were sick. And tonight, if you say, I, I think I'm found. I know where I'm at. I'm comfortable where I am. And I'm just okay as I am. The verse tells you, take a second look. Because here the Savior says, I came to seek and to save those that are lost. Everyone is born lost. It's a guarantee from the Bible. Born lost. Born in our sins. And yet to have a time in your life where you were found by this man, Jesus Christ, found because of what he did at Calvary. I look here and it says the Son of Man. Who's looking? Who's looking? If your mother was anything like my mother, I would look in my room for something for a good half day, and I would come and say, I can't find it, Mom. And she would say, you're not looking. And I, it would actually, it would, it would make me quite angry when she would say it. But she was right. She'd come in the room two minutes, and she'd find whatever I was looking for. And it was true. I just didn't have, seem to have eyes to look for it. How many of us have, have seen individuals, you say, who's, who's looking for the person? If we know the best dogs to put out. You put a bloodhound out. You put, you put the right dog to to get the person to go after and to search and rescue. And we, we, we know these things. We know the standard of the individual who is capable of searching. We send out, we send out police force. We send out individuals with keen eyes. And you think of sometimes, even when planes go down and, and it's such a disaster, it's such a sad event, but the individuals who go out and scan the oceans, and, you, and it's just not everyone's task, but certain individuals go out because there are certain people who are trained just to find those that are lost. How good, how good is God that the man who comes looking for you and I was not an angel, it was not an apostle, it was not some saint, it was not someone given the task who was going to die. But this man who was given this task, the son of man, was the one who died, was buried, and who rose again, who lives. And he's the one who it says he is seeking. He is looking for me to seek and to save me. How tremendous that the man who is looking for me is the same man who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, that's tremendous. Whenever you read of, I was looking the other day at those flyers that you get in the, the coupon section. Uh, I think it's Vlasic, and they, they send out these coupons. And every, every other week you get that coupon of, have you seen me? And I read the stats on it the other day. It was 35 years since they've been doing that and sending out those little coupons of, have you seen me? Over 160 kids have been returned to their parents as a result of those little flyers. And, and how tremendous to think that average citizens of the United States, people who have no connection to these individuals, are reporting them and, and reconnecting them with their loved ones. How much more tremendous that the man who is looking for me loves me and loves me to an extent that is uncomparable. Love me enough to give himself for me. And he's searching. He's searching for the lost. When I think of not only who is searching, but what he is doing has come to seek and to save. I often think about search and rescue missions. I would say the saddest thing of any search and rescue mission. In fact, during the pandemic, I remember reading an article back in early April of the grandniece and great grandson of Robert F. Kennedy and uh, they got lost down in the Chesapeake Bay out on a canoe 
voting. And I remember, I remember reading about it. I think it was on April 2nd. And I remember each day they would give news that they were searching for them. And they had helicopters. They had boats out in the Chesapeake looking for them. And I remember the news around April 7th. And it said this, that the mission had stopped being a rescue mission, but it had continued to just be a search mission. Those are sad words. I can think of any parent or any loved one who's lost someone and you say, when do you call it off? When do you stop looking? When do people finally just give up and say, you know, it's not going to happen. We're going to stop thinking about the rescue. We're just going to look for some closure in the search. And, and it's a devastating thought, but it has to take place. It's got to hurt every person who's ever had to stop looking for some loved one because it's gone on long enough. You know, there's a chapter in this book that we've read tonight, Luke 15. Luke chapter 15 tells me about a lost sheep, and it tells me about a lost coin, and it tells me about a lost son. But more than those lost things that are found, it tells me about the man who looks, and it says this. You go read the words for yourself tonight. If you get a chance tonight, you open your Bible to Luke 15, and you read these first couple of verses, and it tells me this about the man who is looking for sinners who is looking for the lost, it says this, he searches until he finds them. He searches until he finds them. I can almost hear the voices coming back at me tonight. And you would say to me, I know of people that he hasn't found. I wonder why. I know of people that are, are not saved. I know of people who who don't know heaven for sure. I know of people and they're not, they don't have peace with God. I wonder why he hasn't found them. The answer from the Bible is a, is a very clear answer. They're not lost. They don't believe they're lost. Because the Bible tells me someone who realizes they're lost, realizes that they can't find God. They're not going to get their own way to heaven. They're not going to be able to achieve it. Someone who knows they're lost, the Bible tells me he finds them. That's a great promise. It's an unbelievable promise. And here the Son of Man has come. It's already happened. He already came. He came and he went to a cross. He came to die for sinners. He came to seek and to save those that were lost. I, I implore you tonight, take a good look. Take a good look within tonight. Be very transparent before God. If you don't have a time in your life where you recognize you were lost, where you were lost and without hope in this world. But if you had a moment like that, you'll recognize this. To have a moment when you know you're lost would immediately cause you to cast your confidence and trust in this man who seeks and saves the lost. That's who he's looking for, the lost. The tremendous title of all the demographics that we we disdain to be part of in this life. This is the group that at first look, it seems awful to belong to the lost. And yet you read those sweet words of Luke 19 and 10, and you realize this is the only group I ever want to belong to because the son of man, Jesus Christ, has come to seek and to save those that were lost. I close with a story I was reminded of. It was a basketball coach. He was a coach for the Oklahoma City Thunder. And four years ago, Monty Williams lost his wife, Ingrid Williams, in a car crash. It was a devastating loss. He had at least, I think, four or five children. And when interviewed later on about the eulogy he gave at the funeral, he said there were people who come up to him and said, we are sorry for your loss. Monty Williams was a believer in Jesus Christ. And he turned to those people and he said, someone's not lost if you know where they are. What a thought tonight to think. You could know your sins forgiven. You could know whatever happens to you tomorrow, you will be in heaven. And if anything were to happen to you, we could say, someone's not lost if you know where they are. To be in heaven above. Whatever this life brings, whatever this life delivers, to know this and to hang my trust and my faith on this, that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those that are lost. Realize who you are tonight. Realize who he is. And tonight, place your trust in Jesus Christ and know what he has done in order to save your soul. Continue to listen to Matt as he tells us about the one who came to seek and to save the lost.
Thanks, Dave. Uh, I'm going to read uh, Luke chapter 15. Dave and I did not talk about, I never called Dave today to tell him where I was going to read uh, in closing, but very interesting, he mentioned this particular chapter. So Luke chapter 15, and I'm going to read just a couple verses in verse uh, number seven. It says this, I say unto you, this is Jesus Christ speaking, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over 90 and nine just persons which need no repentance. Verse 10, I say unto you, there's joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner that repents. And the last verse of this particular chapter in chapter 15, and I'm telling you this for a reason, I'll get there in a second, says these words, for this, your brother was dead and is alive again. He is lost and is found. Dave mentioned uh, to sum up the gospel in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And I love that verse, especially when you're going to sum up the gospel, perhaps in a nutshell. If you were to sum up perhaps how much you matter on the call today in a world that thrives on likes, in a world that thrives on their social media account being absolutely filled with a, a million likes to identify falsely perceived human worth. Let me read to you this verse. As millions of angels rejoice over a soul that repents, that, my friend, is worth. Jesus says, the Son of God, the Godhead tells human beings, he says, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. That, my friend, is absolute worth. Interesting, if you look at chapter 14 of Luke, Jesus is speaking about inflexible people. He's teaching about inflated people, invited people, indifferent people, indulgent people. And if you skip 15 and jump to 16, he spends a whole chapter on wealth. But if in the middle of those three chapters, 14, 15, and 16, this beautiful chapter, chapter 15, is dedicated, all 32 verses, to showing God's love for sinners. You ask the question, well, does God love me? Christ is speaking about his love for sinners, and it crescendos here in these parables. Do you know for sure? Let me ask you a question. As we start this meeting, I'm probably going to be a little more uh, transparent, perhaps maybe a little more bold, perhaps on the call. Let me just ask you this. Do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? I will tell you this. If there's any hesitation, when I ask the question, do you know for sure you're going to heaven, please, please listen carefully. Because when we speak of this word found and when we speak of this word lost, I've never met anyone that's found that didn't first first realize they were lost. The day I came to trust Christ, I realized I was lost. It's the day that I was found. What about your story? In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, Jesus is telling Nicodemus, uh, sorry, Zacchaeus and many others that are there. He's saying, Zacchaeus, the son of man, Christ is come to seek, to save that which was lost. I personally know that heaven is my home. I love the story Dave closed with tonight. I love, I know that heaven's my home, not because of what I've heard or what David said or what another preacher has told me is because what God said, he said that in his word. John 3.16 is the verse that I came to trust for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him will never perish, but will have everlasting life. The late Billy Graham said these words, I will not go to heaven because I am a preacher. I'm going to heaven entirely on the merit of the work of Christ. Understand this truth tonight, dear friend. If you're lost, you can be found tonight. A big word, found. We could study all of scripture and talk about individuals that were found. Here in this context, Jesus is telling parables because there's Pharisees that lack compassion. There's Pharisees that lack joy for sinners when they repent and are saved. They receive sinners with disdain. Maybe you understand people and maybe you're struggling with a particular sin on this call. And there's people who know about your sin and they look at you as unclean or perhaps unworthy. Can I tell you today that the Complete opposite of what people like that would receive as far as religious leaders receiving sinners with disdain and unclean and unworthy. God receives sinners joyfully. He received you joyfully tonight. All of heaven rejoices. That's what this scripture is saying. That's what Jesus is saying. I know a preacher whose child had just gotten saved and she asked because her grandparents were in heaven. And she said to her preacher or her father, uh, whose name is Tommy, she said, Dad, uh, as just a young girl, she said, Dad, what happened when I got saved? And her dad says, you know, what, what I believe is that when referring to Luke 15, he said, when you got saved, heaven reverberated. The walls of heaven, the walls of heaven echoed with your name, Rosalind, Rosalind, Rosalind. Amazing. 
Angels worshiping. Angels worshiping the king over one soul. That's your worth. God valued you so much, and he gave all of heaven could offer in the person of the person of Christ. Here, tax collectors are coming, and they're sinners, and they're near Christ. And there's Pharisees and scribes, and they're complaining. They're saying, this man eats. He receives sinners. He spends time with sinners. So Jesus, to get into their hearts, to touch their conscience, he speaks of these parables, the parable of the lost sheep. And he's telling them this. He says, which one of you, if you if you had a hundred sheep and you lost one and you went into the wilderness and you overturned every stone and you went to every cliff and you went to every dark chasm that's in the wilderness and you're looking for the sheep and when you found it, you laid it on your shoulders and you rejoice and you come home and you call all together his friends. He's talking about the shepherd that's seeking the sheep, the true shepherd, the one that if three sheep left, he would go and find them. The one, if only one sheep left out of a hundred, he'd go and find them. He'd risk his life to find them. And that's what he's talking about here. He's saying, rejoice for with me. I found my lost sheep, which was lost. I said, rejoice. He says, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, the sinner that has been found over 99 just persons who need no repentance. You think about self-righteous people. Jonathan Edwards mentioned these words. He said, the only thing that man contributes to their salvation is their sin. We cannot get to heaven with our works. We can only get to heaven through the work that's accomplished through the person of Christ. This story shows a loving concern, God concerned for every individual lost person. Every sheep to that shepherd mattered. Every sheep to that shepherd, he was willing to give his life for that sheep. Every soul matters to the God of heaven, regardless of where you come from. Regardless of what school you went to, regardless of what part of town you come from, regardless if you're educated or not educated, regardless if you're rich or you're poor, regardless of the weight and the capacity of your sin, God loves you. He loves you more than any human being will ever love you. And he showed that love. He demonstrated that love. And when the person of Christ went to a cross, you see that in the book of Romans in chapter, 15, in chapter 5, God commends his love toward us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ dies for us. He goes till he finds a sheep. He spares no effort. He does everything to find the sheep. That's why uh, Dave was speaking about in that beautiful verse in Luke 19 and 10, the son of man, Christ has come to seek, to save that which was lost. Constantly seeking, constantly saving. I asked the question, are you saved tonight on the call? Are you going to heaven? There's a day in your life, if you come to trust Christ, that all of heaven rejoice over your precious soul. I love the part in this story that it says the shepherd takes the sheep and he lays the sheep on his shoulders. Can I tell you that that's a picture of eternal salvation? Never to be lost again. Never to be dropped. Never to stray to the side. You're eternally saved, engraven in the palms of his hands. And Jesus builds out the story. He says, not only one out of a hundred sheep. Now we have a parable of a lost coin. He says, oh, what woman? Or what woman having 10 coins? This coin would have been a drachma. It would have been a normal pay for a day's wages. It was valuable to this woman. If she loses one coin, she, she lights a lamp, she sweeps the house, she searches carefully for this coin. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together saying, rejoice with me, for I found the peace which is lost. The value of a soul to God from one out of a hundred sheep to one out of 10 coins, each representing a day's wage. Valuable. Picture this woman frantic, frantically looking. She's searching all day till she finds her day's wage. This light that we spoke about yesterday came into the world. And he brought into the world the word of the gospel, enlightening mankind. Romans 1 and 16 is Paul's reflecting, perhaps on his life, his own testimony. He says these words, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ or the good news of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And Jesus continues building, not only care for a sheep, not only care for this very special coin, but now it's a care for a lost soul, the parable of a lost son. And he starts that out and he says, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them says, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And the story continues. And we don't have too much time to take up the story on this call, but that young boy takes everything the father gave him and he goes into the world and he wastes his living and he spends it on absolute garbage. And the friendships that he had at one point with the money that he had are no longer friends then because he's lost all, all his money. And he comes from a high point in his life to a very low point to where he's eating with pigs. And he finally realizes with a repentant heart, he realizes his condition and where he could be where he, if he was with his father. Have you realized your condition today? A sinner before a holy God, unjust, deserving really of condemnation. But God comes in. 
and he shows his love. And this person here, this prodigal son, he says, I'm going to tell my father, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. And it's interesting that as the son comes home to his father, his father's always watching for his son. His, al his father's always seeking for his son to come home, perhaps looking over the horizon saying, when is my son coming home? He's constantly seeking. The father welcomes him with open arms as the son says, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. Have you ever just come to God? Dave mentioned, used the word transparency today, with absolute transparency, walls of pride pushed to the side, and you say, God, I have sinned. Thanks for sending your son to die for my sins. Have you ever understood what the Bible teaches about the person of Christ? He satisfied all the Godhead for all of eternity with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Are you, are you going to heaven? Are you saved? Do you have a relationship with Christ? Do you know for sure when we leave time, as we know it today, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're going to heaven. Is there a day you can look back to and realize that you had been found? If I asked the leper today, and we went back and we pulled the leper out, we said, leper, listen, uh, are you going to heaven? He would say this, there was a day, Matt, that I was found. There was a day that I was dead in my sins. I had leprosy. I was suffering under the chronic plague of leprosy. And I met the person of Christ, and he found me, and he saved me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. If I asked Zacchaeus, and we took the story of Dave just mentioned to you today, I said, Zacchaeus, listen, are you going to heaven? He would say this, Matt, there was a day that I was found. It was outside a little city of Jericho. I was up in a sycamore tree, and Christ said to me, Zacchaeus, you come down. For today, I would abide at your house. And I was saved. Jesus told me those words. For the Son of Man has come to seek, to save that which was lost. If I came and I asked the thief who was on the cross, someone in a worse situation than anyone you find in Scripture, he is nailed to a cross. He's nailed to his sins. And I said, listen, man, are you going to heaven? He would say this. You know, there was a day I was found. I was found nailed to my sins. I was found when I was paying for my sins. I was found just hours or minutes right before I passed from time into eternity. And Christ found me. And he promised me today, you will be with me in paradise. I know a dear man by the name of Jose. And he sat under preaching at uh, Pacific Garden Mission where we spent some time. And the brother that I was with was preaching on the verse Dave just spoke about tonight. Luke 19 and verse 10 about Zacchaeus. This young man at 22, he sat there stone cold. Then as Brother Curran was preaching, tears began to form. You saw he was broken. We asked him after the meeting. I said, is, there, is everything okay? He said these words. You know, I always blame my parents for kicking me out of the house. But I just learned tonight from the Bible that the real problem wasn't my parents. My real problem was my sin. And God revealed himself to me tonight. He found me tonight. And I found out that I'm going to heaven because Jesus paid for my sins and they've been forgiven. For the Son of Man has come to seek. And to save that which was lost. Are you lost tonight? Have you ever come to Christ just the way you are? You know, Isaac Watts, I close with this hymn. He wrote this hymn. Isaac Watts was 1674 to 1748. I'm going to read this hymn to you. And I just want to know if you understand what these words mean. He said these words. One of my favorite hymns. I used to sing it uh, probably at the age of four to uh maybe seven or eight years old, I used to jump on a little wooden horse in the basement of my home, and I'd sing this hymn to the top of my lungs, but I wasn't saved. I didn't understand it. I just liked the tune of it. But maybe you understand it tonight. Maybe the first time you hear it, and you say, you know what? That's my Savior, and I'm placing my faith and trust in him. Listen to the words. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he, Christ, devote that sacred head for such a worm as I, the writer's understanding his condition, a worm like me. Was it for sins that I had done? He groaned upon the tree, Christ groaning on a tree on the cross. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well, might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ, the mighty maker, died for man, his creature's sin. Have you understood that? That the mighty maker, Christ, he died for man. His creature sin. The writer continues and says, Thus might I hide my blushing face while his dear cross appears, dissolve my heart and thankfulness and melt mine eyes to tears. That could be you tonight. Your heart dissolved in thankfulness. Very simply, you just come to trust Christ that he died on a cross. The chorus reads this At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It's there by faith I received my sight. And now I'm happy all the day. At six weeks old, Fanny Crosby got a cold. 
and inflammation to her eyes, ended up ending up in permanent blindness. 71 years she went through her life like this, blind. They called Fanny Crosby the queen of gospel songwriters. She wrote more than 8,000 hymns and gospel songs. But while singing this song, thus might I hide my blushing face while his dear cross appears, dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt mine eyes to tears. She was singing this song in a revival meeting in the year 1850. And she said, as I sang those words at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, she said these words, my soul is flooded with a celestial light. My soul is flooded with a celestial light. Blind, but she's on her way to heaven. She had an appreciation of Christ. Your soul tonight could be flooded with the light of the glorious gospel of Christ tonight. Sins forgiven, a home in heaven, your name engraven in the palms of his hands, and Christ as your eternal Savior. Let's pray together.